Welcome to the MHPN Working Better Together online conference. I'm John Cooper, consultant psychiatrist at the Centenary of Anzac Centre and the chair of today's discussion. The Centenary of Anzac Centre provides free advice, consultation and support to practitioners nationally who work with veterans with mental health problems. And the case that we're about to discuss uh, exemplifies the fact that uh, this service is also available to folk who work to support veterans even if they're not clinicians. Specifically, our practitioner support service provides case consultation and access to a team of multidisciplinary experts for advice specific to your inquiry. We have access to psychiatrists, psychologists, general practitioners and social work family therapists, all very experienced in the complexities and challenges of veteran mental health. Today you will hear these experts as they discuss a current case consultation live and work through the best treatment options, evidence-based research and practice, and how to integrate this for a better clinical outcome. The case that you will hear about is fictitious and a composite of typical cases that have come to the practitioner support service. When cases come to us, they are de-identified and every effort is made to protect privacy and ensure confidentiality. So let's get started. Participating in today's uh, session uh, is Jane Poole, a social worker and family therapist from Adelaide, Richard Bonwick, a psychiatrist, and Jeff Thompson, a psychiatrist, both from Melbourne, Phil Parker, a consultant GP from Brisbane, and Christy Heffernan, a clinical psychologist from Sydney. For those on our call, you have had a chance to read over the case notes. But let's uh, start with this particular case. And we have a worker, Jim, who calls in from an ex-service organisation, Anzac and Friends, which provides social support, welfare assistance and wellbeing programs to veterans. He has some training in community welfare and a lot of experience in working with veterans. So at this very early stage of uh, the details of this referral, I'm wondering what the team thinks about the difference in taking calls from non-clinical folk who are working with veterans compared to uh, the clinical referrals that we get. Jeff, what do you think? Oh, look, I'll jump in. That um, Jeff here from Melbourne. Uh, I think one of the things that's really important to for us as, a, as a, a group to be mindful of is that we're dealing with people who are not clinicians. Um, some of them... Uh, may not have any sort of uh, clinical background um, and it's very uh, important because often the, the, um, the, these workers are doing a really important and critical work and certainly can help facilitate um, uh, engagement and, and access to appropriate support and, and treatment for our veterans. Um, but it's really important that we support them if uh, if they are being exposed to um, challenging material and also sometimes the veterans might have unrealistic expectations of, of what they can actually do as opposed to seeking you know, treatment from the appropriate people. So um, su supporting the workers and, and supporting them in, in setting uh, clear boundaries while still providing important help, I think, is, is one of the important aspects of it. Yes, I, I agree completely, Jeff. So let's uh, move on. So Jim is working with a 39-year-old female. She was an aircraft technician in the RAAF, one of few females in her trade. She was in service for 10 years and was a corporal at discharge. She was referred to Jim's social support groups, which included some regular physical activities, such as park walks, yoga and bike rides, and social barbecues every few months. She got referred because she spoke to an advocate about her back condition and the difficulties getting it recognised by DVA, and told him that she didn't have any close family that she lived with and didn't really want to be involved with any ex-service stuff. The client has a history of depression and suicidal ideation following a motor vehicle accident. She was hospitalised briefly to manage this and subsequently referred to a psychiatrist for ongoing management. Although Jim's not sure how engaged she is with the psychiatrist. 
So let's pause there. And I'm wondering um, what the team thinks are the likely uh, themes or concerns that are likely to arise for uh, Jim in this particular case. It's Christy from Sydney here, a clinical psychologist. Um, I think a couple of the issues thus far are it's um, it being referred to um, to an, an ESO to provide social support and, and assistance sounds like a really good referral when, when somebody isn't um, actually engaged in regular social support. So I can understand why this particular lady has been referred to um, to Jim's organisation to actually get that social support. Um, one of my issues around that is that she doesn't seem to be a very willing participant at this stage. Um, Regardless, she did attend, so she's made some sort of um, she's got some sort of motivation to go. But um, that's just something to flag at this stage in terms of her her actual motivation to to attend. And I guess one of the other issues for me, for with my clinical psych hat on, is just noting that um, motor vehicle accidents can be uh, potentially traumatic events, um, and so that might be something that we're that we're dealing with here. That there might be some sort of um, of trauma-informed care that we, we might need to think about at this stage. That They're just my initial thoughts. Any red flags uh, for you, Phil, in terms of somebody with uh, a chronic back condition? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, she's, if she's got underlying medical conditions, they're sort of going to have a contributing effect upon her general uh, emotional well-being and, and potentially mm -hmm. her mental health. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think it's good that she's engaged with Jim and... and what she's provided is a fair bit of information, which which sort of surprises me for someone who is reluctant to engage um, and and reveal uh, elements of her past. So that's that's really good. So he's obviously made a, a had a big effect upon her, and he's and he's quite mm -hmm. supportive. It's important that we therefore use that to leverage a little bit more clinical support slowly and carefully, so we don't lose her, um, because we we don't want to burden Jim. With, um, with 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 uh, you know clinical expectations that are, are, are far too too demanding for him, um, so we need to use his position to try and engage uh, a general practitioner potentially at the start and someone that he he might know who can who can give her an, an excellent uh, level of support and encourage her to, uh, her to engage with. Jane here, social worker. Um, yeah, I think some information around the motor vehicle accident would be really important. I'd also be interested in knowing, um, it says that um, that she doesn't have any close family um, that she lived with. So I guess that I'm wondering whether that's relationship close or proximity close. Um, so uh, some more information, just in terms of be, being, able, being mindful to build a support network for her around maybe potential family and or and or friends. And I guess that the other thing that I would be mindful of with, with Jim is that um, sometimes um, people that do this really good work in our ex-service organisations have their own trauma history as well. Excellent point, Jane. Thanks. So let me um, give you a bit more information that we've got from Jim. He reports that his client can be difficult to manage. She often gets very angry with him about DVA not recognising her claim, and that even though she tells, he tells her that he has nothing to do with DVA, this makes no difference. Despite this, she is frequently calling him seeking support. Last week, she came into the office in a distressed state asking to speak to Jim. She told him that she had been speaking with another female vet who she met at a recent barbecue, who told her about being raped whilst she was in the army. Jim's client broke down in tears and says she cannot stop thinking about her friend's story and has been having nightmares since she heard it. She then discloses to Jim that she also was raped whilst in the RAAF, but has never told anybody about it. She tells Jim that she does not want anyone else to know about it and that he is not to pass it on to her GP or psychiatrist. Jim's not sure what to do. So, what's your advice, expert panel? Jeff here. Um, look, this is a this is a very uh, difficult uh, and uh, no doubt uncomfortable position for Jim to find himself in. But it probably also comes about because of the uh, success Jim has actually had in building a, a connection 
um, with uh, with the veteran that um, you know the fact that uh, she's been attending, she's been revealing information, she came to him at a time of distress. So, in spite of her her protests about being angry with him, which is really her ang- anger with DVA, she's she's very much voting with her feet by her attendance and and reaching out to him at times. So. Um, clearly Jim's playing a really important role at that point Um, but probably partly as a result of that he now um, has uh, has received from her some information which which puts him in in a difficult position and you know it's always difficult when uh, you're told something and then uh, um, you very promptly said but you're not allowed to tell anyone and I, I'd be sort of uh, I think it's important that we help support Jim with the impact it might be having on him but also give him some sort of pretty clear guidelines as to to what the boundaries should be and that is that he doesn't actually have to take on responsibility for this and that to as we were saying earlier the importance of the clear boundaries that uh, his role is is to provide support and to perhaps reassure her that um, be distressed at this time is is understandable, but uh, be encouraging her to take that information to the people who can help her with it, such as her her treating team. Still here. I, I agree absolutely, Jeff. I think I think he needs to continually remind her that he is there to support her and and that the best outcomes that can be achieved for her care is that if she engages with people who are going to help her. Um, and, and to do that, it might be worthwhile, obviously, figuring out whether she has, has a GP that she sees. We're not sure about that, um, firstly. And secondly, whether she has um, she, she's received DVA support in terms of mental health care in the past. Uh, we we don't really know whether that exists. We don't know if she has a white card. So it might be worthwhile him trying to to discuss those as options for care for her. Uh, Jane here. Yeah, I um, was going to say what um, uh, what Phil was saying as well. And I guess maybe um, working um, uh, with Jim to facilitate if she uh, doesn't have a regular GP, but also maybe a referral to Open Arms for some. Um, for some uh, counselling as as well, and I guess just trying to um, work with Jim to help spread the load for him. It's Christy here from from Sydney. Um, uh, I w- I would probably I agree with the comments that have made thus far. It is really probably very uncomfortable for Jim to have this conversation um, with her, and you know the sense of responsibility. Um, you know, would be would be apparent, but agree that reinforced to him one of the things that I would be saying to Jim, and I think we need to feedback is that you know he doesn't need he, he doesn't need to be responsible for her safety or her care that a clinical team kind of is is necessary, um, but also sort of giving him just some information about you know that that sexual assault rapes can be really traumatic and it really does destabilize can destabilize people um, that distress that she's experiencing is 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 quite normal if she's been triggered and that you know safety and trust is really important in relationships and that her ability to disclose to Jim um, means that he's kind of developed that nice safe and trusting relationship with her and that's really important um, but encourage that she encourage her to actually then seek help by professionals who can who can help her with that and um, the difficulty probably of actually telling somebody for the very first time that she never told anybody um, about the sexual assault in the past, but Jim is the first person that that um, kind of explained to Jim that that can be a first hurdle and that it probably would be easier for her to seek help from here because she's already kind of um, disclosed that, but it's also important to get her into help because she's of the highly distressed nature that she's in. It's Phil here. Sorry, Christy, I agree. And I think her asking for help or willing to to disclose to Jim about the rape suggests that she's now a bit more open to mm. to seeking help or seeking support for for her background. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. And it and it might be, I mean, particularly the trigger seems to be um, having contact with the other female veteran in the group. Um, but, you know, in the background of a recent um, motor vehicle accident as well, her sense of safety and trust in the world's already been, um, been shaken and destabilised by that as well. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a combination of those factors. I think it's important that's building up now for her to really seek support. Jane here. Um, yeah, agree agree with all of um, all of what's already been said. We just need to be also mindful um, that she did have a period of um, of being quite suicidal after the car accident. Um, and we can potentially put two and two together around um, around stress levels um, and monitoring her risk at this point in time as well. And that's a really big ask for Jim. Yeah. R Richard here, psychiatrist. It, it seems like the key role for Jim is to facilitate the right sort of support and assistance for her, the right sort yeah. of su professional support and assistance for her. And one of our major roles, I guess, is to, to provide information to Jim about what sort of services are actually available so that he can assist with that facilitation. He may or may not be aware of uh, uh, mental health services. Uh, he may or may not be aware even of, uh, of the DVCS or open arms. So I think giving him some clear direction about that is, is very much a key to this. I agree, Richard. It's Christy again from Sydney, but it also um, giving him the list of emergency contact details that, you know, if it does escalate and, you know, he needs to call triple zero and that, that down to that level of detail, I think we can provide that level of support to, to Jim. Yeah, um, um, and maybe we could find out from Jim what kind of support he's able to get through Anzac and Friends, um, mm -hmm. and um, and you know whether there's kind of a process um, already in place for supporting um, for supporting Jim with the work that he's doing as well and capitalising on that. It's John here. So, would it be fair to say that um, in relation to these thoughts about how Jim is supported? Uh, in his organisation, um, is this the sort of uh, situation where what's called trauma-informed care um, would be relevant, uh, either for Jim as an individual or for his organisation as a whole in terms of uh, further training or assistance in that direction? Christy from Sydney here. Yeah, I, absolutely, John. I think um, more education around trauma-informed care principles are really important. I've mentioned them um, thus far, just at um, increasing people's sense of safety, um, trust, their level of control and, and empowerment to make decisions. Um, that they're, they're really key ingredients with regard to um, trauma-informed care because once somebody has been through a trauma, they're the things, they're the that, things that, that tends to um, destabilise people and um, to regain a sense of kind of emotional control, it's really important to um, try and facilitate. Um, and um, and you know, Jim is a perfect example of the types of people that we would usually educate people on trauma-informed care principles. They're, they're really the first responders with regard to mental health. Um, you know, us as we as clinicians sort of um, we get referred up from the first responders so it's really important that we, we educate people on the ground so to speak in that first responder roles around um, what they can do to kind of um, stabilise a situation as well as give them the emergency contact details and things when risk is, is present um, and also the referring um, treating kind of uh, teams and things that can uh, uh, that people can then access. So I think that's really important. And as part of the PSS, we also do provide educational seminars to um, organisations like gyms um, with regard to just increasing mental health awareness um, and also um, how they can maintain their own self-care, um, educational seminars on, on what um, good family support systems look like for veterans and, and things like that. So there's a number of educational seminars that we can uh, that we do provide to, to these organisations for this purpose to try and increase their knowledge um, and um, think about some skills they might want to develop in this area. Thanks, Christy. Let me um, be the devil's advocate here. And uh, Jim comes back to us and says that he's uh, said and done all of those things to his client, but she's still adamant that she's not going to seek uh, professional clinical support. What do we advise Jim under that circumstance? Phil? 
Yeah, this this is Phil. It's certainly a a difficult one. It's put him in a a position where he will feel quite isolated in terms of his his responsibilities of caring for her. We we probably we probably need to so we can't expect him to assess her risk, although he might have some ideas about whether she he thinks she's a you know a danger. I think I think we need to find out what her agenda is. What you know, she's obviously starting to open up, and and she's willing to engage with him and connect with him and reveal some of the some of the sort of really sensitive, deep issues from her background. But we need to probably um, we probably need to get him to continue to ask for her willingness to engage with people who can help her. Um, but but it's so dependent on what she wants to get out of that. Just wonder what the thoughts of everyone else is on this. It's Jane here. Yep, I I agree. I guess that I would go with um, what's what's already in place. So that we know that she has a psychiatrist for ongoing management, but we're not really quite sure how how engaged with the psychiatrist she is. So finding out her level of engagement might be um, might be of use. And again, finding out whether there's any other support, non clinical support, mm. in her in her life in terms of family or or um, and or friends or you know, if she's working, um, anything that might just broaden the level of support that we can uh, that we can get for um, uh, for this for this client. And then, you know, if there is somebody that's particularly close to her, then you know, they may be able to help um, facilitate a referral for um, for clinical involvement. Christy here from from Sydney. Um, I I agree, Jane. I think that trying to establish what other social support she's got is really important, so that um, so that that's really important in terms of her care, but also so that Jim isn't necessarily dealing with this on his own. Um, he has, also has the support of his own group, so even though um, she's not necess- hasn't necessarily been motivated to attend, she has attended, um, and while she's you know, discussed with another female veteran her own experience which triggered her own um, emotional reaction that there might be other people within the group that this can form a supportive environment for her um, and also for Jim as well so he's not necessarily um, managing this on his own and with time hopefully um, and in still encouraging her to seek help um, and going back to her GP um, that, you know, that, though, that, that support could facilitate her help seeking. Um, from a clinical support. Jane again, and um, and I, I guess that the other thought that I have is that would be really important for the ducks to be in a row because there might be just a, a window of opportunity where this person goes, yes, I will, you know, I will seek some clinical support. So having that information and trying to facilitate that as quickly and as seamlessly as possible would, um, would potentially help that initial engagement process. Mm. Um, Jeff here, psychiatrist. Um, look, I, I think um, we've seen with with his client that sometimes what she says and what she does don't they don't align. Mm. So she has been voting with her feet. She has been attending, even though she probably is verbalising often that um, you know she, she prefers to be isolated and not connected. So mm. reassuring Jim that continuing to invite her to be part of their activities and to attend and to, to move amongst uh, other ex-servicemen, I think, um, is playing an important role and to not underestimate yeah. the value of that for his client in an ongoing process. Um, I think also we can reassure Jim by you know, uh, informing him that uh, you know, people who've been sexually assaulted, it's really important for them that they don't feel sort of forced or coerced or pressured to, mm. to explore things until they're actually ready and to reassure him that, that that sometimes takes you know quite some time could be months could be years some on some occasions so that providing he that the limit of what he can actually do is is uh, continue to encourage her to to be engaged with the people that can help her, encourage her to look after herself and connect with people and connect with their group and reminding Jim of of the fact that the things that he's doing are actually really valuable 
um, and but there is a limit to how much he can do in terms of the decisions that she might make for herself in terms of her care. Richard here, uh, psychiatrist again. It, it sounds like patience and polite persistence is the key. Often we want to fix things, but sometimes you just have to be patient and just persist with what is the right plan, and I think that's really what you've articulated, Jeff. Yep. Phil here, I agree. I think um, we our ultimate... Our ultimate goal is to build her clinical support team, the right team for her, you know, one that she, she trusts and will engage with to get the best outcomes. But we need to maintain support for Jim throughout this process. And, and yes, it may take time and we may need to give him options if he believes that she's, her, her level of risk has increased as well. Thanks, Bill. It's uh, John here. And if I can summarise uh, what we've discussed today, uh, Jim, working in an ex-service organisation, supporting other veterans, uh, a very difficult scenario um, of uh, a distressed veteran with trauma in her background and other complexities around her medical and social circumstances. We want to provide Jim with information and education. We want to reassure and support him in the excellent work that he's doing. Um, part of that education is going to be around his self-care and how to maintain good healthy boundaries. And this is going to lead us into uh, uh, work that we would call trauma-informed practice. And that might be relevant for him as an individual, but it might also be relevant for his organisation and uh, in his organisation's efforts to support the work that they do. So thank you all for your excellent contribution today. Thank you to those listening in today. When you contact the Centenary of Anzac Centre Practitioner Support Service for advice, we take your veteran mental health question or problem, we consult with our experts just like we've done today, and we provide specific advice back to you. This is a free service. You can access this service through our website at www.anzaccentre.org.au or you can call us on 1800 VET777. Thank you very much.